Thank you very much, everybody. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here at TED to the Power of X in Cheltenham. It's the nearest I'm going to get to doing an X Factor performance, so I'm going to thoroughly enjoy it. Um, my talk today is about the connection between health, happiness, prosperity, and the environment. Now, they might sound like disconnected uh, entities, but actually, when you look at each of them, there is such a close relationship that, to me, it's almost about common sense. And that's why it's so important to try and get across some of these areas that verge into the political, and I'll certainly, I'm sure, get quite passionate about some of the areas too, because I can't understand why the connections aren't made in our everyday lives and in decisions that are made on our behalf. So if we look first of all at health, um, yes, my poor little friend there, um, health is again one of those subjects that is highly emotive. Obviously we all get really um, concerned not only about our own health but the health of the nation, international health. But what I've been particularly interested in recently is the very specific relationship between aspects of environmentalism that have a direct impact on health. And I'm not just talking about things like global warming and, and those sort of uh, direct impacts, but things like, for example, carcinogens. Now, we all know that there are um, chemicals in our lives and in the, in the world that affect us, but I was horrified to find out there's about 70,000 chemicals that are actually part of our everyday lives. And most of these chemicals have really only appeared in our lives over the last probably 30 or 40 years. Interesting to note within that is that there's about 600 of those which are pretty much accepted as being very carcinogenic or highly likely to be. And of those, there's about 49 that there are groups who are really passionately campaigning at the moment to get them banned and removed from products. Some companies have voluntarily removed those um, uh, ingredients and others are still trying to defend their right to incorporate them in on the basis of uh, the fact that there isn't enough evidence to say that they're dangerous. Now, for me, there's this very strange situation occurring in that we know that cancer rates are increasing uh, apparently we have a one in three chance of developing cancer in our lifetime. But when you look at the patterns of what's been happening over the last 30 or 40 years, uh, as these chemicals have been increasing in our world, uh, is we have things like, for example, in the 1960s, women had a one in 20 chance of developing breast cancer. Now it's about one in nine. So there is a relationship, I know there's lots of other factors that influence whether or not you're likely to get cancer and there will be um, obviously hereditary factors, there'll be other environmental impacts. But to me there's a very strong reason to question how we link what is in our environment with what we are um, doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Now if you look at things like um, for example, the amount of money that's spent on cancer research, it's now about £500 million a year in the UK alone. Now, that's fantastic. Obviously, we do want money to go into that. But of that £500 million a year, only about 3.4% of that actually goes into looking into seriously the causes of cancer. We seem to be obsessed with trying to find cures. But if we know that there's been this massive increase over the last generation or so, and we know that there's all these chemicals that are uh, you know, culminating to create cocktails within our bodies and within our environments, why aren't we doing more to stop it at source? Why are we trying to spend all this money and raise all this money um, and, and all the knock-on effects that has? You know, why are we allowing more people really to expose themselves to, you know, what are either life-limiting or life-terminating illnesses? So I find that a really interesting philosophical and ethical point as much as anything else. Because if we're in this position where all of this money is being spent on research and we're not actually stopping at source, it's all the wrong way around. So that's where... It's certainly in terms of um, the amount of R&D, you know, why can't we 
fundamentally change our attitude towards what causes ill health. Now, we, if we look at the contrast between, say, the developed world and the developing world, again, we've got an interesting situation that's, that's brewing. In the developing countries, they're obviously fighting um, all sorts of tropical illnesses, uh, malaria, dysentery, illnesses associated with poverty. Uh, we've also got AIDS as a, a major issue in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So there's all sorts of things that are being dealt with in the developing world, and obviously there are certain cures and there are certain changes in, in behaviour and lifestyle that can contribute to eliminating some of those diseases. But at the same time, one of the big aims within, uh, I suppose, the, the whole sort of principle of, of, of um, uh, eliminating poverty is the idea of increasing wealth and uh, privilege within countries where they don't already have it. Now, what we end up there is with a situation where we've got corporations developing their businesses in countries that at the moment aren't exposed to the levels of heart disease, cancer, uh, type 2 diabetes, all of these illnesses and conditions which are symptomatic of the Western developed world. And all we're going to do over time, really, is transport those to another generation of people who are going to be susceptible to the same things because we're going to implant them into their world. We might get rid of some of the other um, nasties they're dealing with, but are we just going to flip it and create another um, load of problems for them? So when you look at the planet and what's happening with the world at the moment, we know there's all sorts of issues to do with overpopulation. Uh, there are issues to do with food security, uh, water, uh, obviously huge social inequalities. There's just a whole range of problems. But most of them actually come back to common sense decisions about how we deploy our resources and our attitude to those resources. And health is really the linchpin of a lot of these areas because, as we all know, if you've got good health, you can work, you can look after your family, you're much more likely to be um, contributing in, in every possible positive way into society. If you don't have health, all of those things start to crumble and eradicate and the costs involved um, obviously escalate. Apparently, at the moment, it costs about £30,000 per person to treat somebody in the UK who has cancer. And the prediction is, people have just done a big study, that by 2021, that cost is est estimated to be around £40,000 per patient. Now, if one of the three of us are likely to get cancer in our lifetime, the figures simply don't stack up. There's no way our National Health Service, even if you take every other illness out of the equation, there's no way the NHS or the social networks can cope with dealing with that volume of requirements on, and drains on resources and, and, and the call on the cash within the NHS system. So we have to do something, we have to do it fast, because if we want everybody to have a, a healthy, productive life, if we want people to be contributing positively to society rather than drawing on those resources from the NHS, all we're doing at the moment is actually increasing the imbalance and getting more people who are actually going to be on the receiving end of services and not uh, feeding into the system. So it's critically, critically important that we get this balance sorted out and do it really quickly. And for me, the quickest way of doing that is not pouring more money into research, it's pouring more money into um, either lobbying or legislating against the ability of organisations to include any substance within the formulation of their product that they know or anyone suspects has a a carcinogenic element to it. Now, I know it's probably slightly simplistic for me to be saying this because there are so many other factors, but that one element alone, um, there's a lot of people working very hard in the USA at the moment um, on uh, the Safe Chemicals Act. And the idea behind that is uh, to take the idea of the precautionary principle, whereby you cannot have an ingredient in a product unless it is proven to be safe. Whereas the way it works at the moment is unless something's proven to be unsafe, you, it, there's no obligation for it to be removed from a product. So why is that so important? Well, the reason it's so important is that you could say, well, we've all got choice and we can all choose the products we use. But can we? I mean, if I took you on a shopping trip through a supermarket at the moment and we went down each aisle and we went down the fresh food aisle and we've come across all of the uh, food ingredients 
that have pesticides sprayed on them. You know, salad ingredients are one of the worst where they get multiple sprays of, of pesticides, heavily loaded. Um, virtually all our fruit and veg um, is in some way either sprayed or protected in order to increase its lifespan. Um, we've got obviously a fundamental issue there. You can then continue down onto the aisles where, where you've got bread products. A lot of the bread products now, you've probably noticed, are getting longer and longer sell-by dates. Well, that's because there are more and more um, additives being put in to prolong the life of that bread. Now, it, we just presumably have to change our behaviour a little bit and just have bread that lasts a day or so, as opposed to bread that might last 10 days. It's actually a very unnatural thing to have a product that lasts that long. If we go into the, um, the, the, the cleaning products, um, some horrific ingredients in uh, normal cleaning products that we all use every day, uh, not just bleaches and, uh, and whatever, but, ev but virtually every detergent will have something in it that will not only be detrimental to health in terms of things like carcinogens, but also uh, ingredients which uh, are harmful in terms of things like asthma, um, uh, uh, can contribute to headaches, to all sorts of you know, heart disease, all sorts of things. I'm not a clinician, I'm not an expert on all of these areas, but if you actually do um, uh, an internet search on all of the uh, product groups that you're interested in and see which products to avoid, you will be absolutely horrified which have dangerous elements in them. So it's really important when we're actually looking at, at the ingredients that we have in our everyday lives that we understand that apparently we have between five and 700 uh, chemical traces in our body at any one time. Now that is, again, it's got to be completely unnatural, hasn't it? And the problem is that if you look at individual chemicals, it might be that somebody can say that individual chemical is safe, but what they can't say is what the cumulative effect will be over 20 or 30 years or, th or crossing generations of the build-up of those chemicals. They won't be able to tell what the um, individual physiology of the person might be and how they might respond to certain chemicals, although we know at the moment that about 20% of the US population are known to be hypersensitive. So there's all these sort of areas which come in and... And it's, it's really this sort of impact, as I say, the, 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 the question mark of the unknown and the cumulative impacts that allow corporations really to go under the radar to avoid um, doing what they really ought to be doing in order to protect the wider good. And that means it's really um, important for us as citizens, wherever we live, whatever we do, um, you know, if you have the opportunity to choose a product that is safer than another product, and let's just hope there's not greenwash there and people aren't pretending their product is safe when it isn't. But if you get the choice to use a safe alternative product, you must take that choice. It really isn't helpful to say that product costs 5p more or 10p more or whatever, and therefore I'm going to choose the cheaper product. Even if it's a pound or two more, there will come a point in time when you will have to make decisions between taking responsibility for the health and well-being of your own family and using less of certain products, wasting less. Um, apparently, something like 30% of our food goes in the bin. So when people complain about the, um, the, the, the cost of their supermarket shop, we know that obviously there is, and I know there are people who are in, in, in dire straits within the current economic climate, but the vast majority of people in the UK are still throwing away huge amounts of food. So if we could make savings in certain areas of our spending in order to perhaps fund the difference between buying safer products, then there needn't be an extra cost to us for making those right choices. But also what will happen is the reason why those products are generally more expensive is because they haven't got the critical mass. So if, again, we start making better choices as a population and we start choosing products encouraging manufacturers to um, give us healthier products, there won't be an incentive for them to, to keep manufacturing the unhealthy ones. So it's, again, all well and good to look to the law and legislation and government, but we've really got to think very carefully about our own um, role in this as well. And when I've spoken to people about it, they've been shocked. They've said they haven't realised there's been such a, um, a massive link.
So in terms of happiness, well, obviously there's a very close link there because if you've got fundamental happiness, if you've got a sense of um, well-being, um, if you've got uh, you know, your fundamental health, you are going to be a much more positive member of society and there will be less for you to worry about. So we've got to get that, again, essential link between happiness and health as a core value within society. The NHS say that by 2020, depression is going to be the biggest illness in the UK. Now, that trajectory had started before the economic crisis we're in now, so it isn't directly related to the situation we're in, although no doubt it will be exacerbated by that. But actually what's been happening is we've had this, again, this, this disconnect between the richness of the lives that we actually enjoy in this country, but a lack of appreciation of the detail of what that means. So we're focusing on negativity. We need to start focusing on the positive aspects, the simple things, the healthy things, the outdoor life, all of those things which don't cost us anything, but actually contribute enormously to our physical and mental well-being. Making good choices in what we eat, what we drink, how we live our lives is our individual choice and that's where we need to focus. Prosperity. Well, again, this is quite an interesting one because we've got this whole relationship with, um, uh, again, with, with the amount of money that goes into negative things. If you just think about how much cash goes into dealing with the negatives in our society, dealing with crime, dealing with ill health, dealing with um, the social inequalities. All of those things are draws on the, um, on, on the finances of, uh, of our society because we're allowing the negativity to build up over the generations. Now, again, I know we've probably got a very well-educated audience here. You probably all make good choices as much as you possibly can. But as good citizens, we have to be reaching out to other people in our communities. We have to be connecting more with other groups in society. And we have to be using our voice to lobby for change. We have to use our voice with the local supermarkets and with other uh, providers. And we have to find ways of actually bringing all that into our way of life in a way that we don't actually feel very comfortable with normally. But we know that time is running out in terms of making the right decisions. And if we don't do things differently, we're not going to be able to breach that, those um, differences. So prosperity really, again, is the cumulative effect of good health, happiness. Prosperity is in the mind of the beholder. You don't have to have huge riches. I've been privileged enough to spend a couple of um, periods of time volunteering in, uh, in rural western Kenya. And I can assure you that people in mud huts with no electricity, no running water, um, and very, very little in terms of any kind of material possession will probably display more happiness and more sense of um, pride in whatever they do own than anybody you would meet in a, in a country where you know probably you know the vast majority of us will have a, 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 you know a decent fixed roof over our head and possibly a car on the drive and the odd holiday it's, it really is all about how we how we view that and how we take that forward so we've got this environmental link there which is Again, about just rebalancing what we do on our planet, how we approach life, how we approach health, how we approach the basic fundamental concepts of health, happiness, prosperity and the environment as an integrated holistic view. Not about politics in terms of um, policies or legislation in individual areas. It's about pulling it all together. It's about understanding that it's the integration of all of those things that are going to be the recipe for good, happy and healthy lives. Thank you.